and we are recording. Uh, welcome to GUI and Inweb Browsers B Weekly Call for 21st of April, I believe, 2020. Um, this week, we have, maybe I'll share a screen. This week, we have some topics on the agenda. Feel free to add more. Uh, but the very first news I'd like to uh, announce is that we now have a new team member. So uh, I stop sharing and uh, welcome Rafael to the GUI and IPFS team. Uh, say hi Thanks. and a few words about yourself. Hi everyone. Hi Jacob, nice to meet you as well. Uh, we, we haven't been introduced yet, it's a pleasure. Uh, so I work at Moxie, uh, same as Vasco. Vasco is an old friend of mine too. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm a very UI and UX oriented uh, developer. I always like to provide uh, nice features uh, in terms of UX and really pretty in terms of UI. Uh, since I have a, a friend that has some uh, disabilities visually. He has a 80% impairment visu visibility um, and he always tells me about these problems uh, when using websites. So I have a lot of attention to accessibility because of that. So I guess that helps in this specific project because uh, I believe we're lacking a bit of accessibility and I want to bring that to the table and improve that. Um, and about myself, I'm really passionate about animations and making fast and nice websites. So I guess, I guess that's my profile in too long didn't read it <laughs> format. But yeah, if you have any questions, you can always uh, pop a message on Slack. I'm always happy to answer them. And if you need help with anything, uh, you're welcome to ask for my help as well. I really like helping others. It's one of my favorite things to do as a uh, developer, pair programming and such. Awesome, awesome. Super, su super stoked to, uh, to have you on board and I already love the work you are doing on the peer screen. <laughs> so, Thanks. cool. I, I asked if, Oops. <laughs> I asked if you wanted to demo. Um, so if there's room later on, um, <laughs> Raphael actually just sent me a video of a demo and I'm like, show everybody. Okay. It's I not finished, you... but I'll show it. I think we, yeah, we have it on the agenda later. Cool. This, this is a good place for, uh, for works in progress. We show them off team. Yep. Um, all right, folks. Uh, next item on the agenda is native protocol handler API for browser extensions update. Uh, so the update will be from me. The update is, I'm not sure if I, uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Um, so the update is uh, the PR with the dev grant it got merged. Uh, the paperwork started and if anyone is interested, oh gosh, what did I do? If anyone is interested in the actual dev grant on the PR, there's a link you can, you can like read the entire thing. Um, including the the milestones. Um, so that's the update, work in progress. Uh, I think I went over the, this in some detail, but in, uh, if there are any questions, I'm around to answer them. Um, cool. Uh, the next one is Gosh, I'm constantly sharing my screen and not sharing it. Maybe I'll just keep it like this. <laughs> All right, um, bit chaotic today for some reason. So there's this web platform incubator community group uh, under W3C and they have a forum where uh, some discussions about uh, extending the web platform happens, some proposals and there is a topic of filling the remaining gap between WebSockets 
WebRTC and uh, this future uh, spec that is proposed called Web Transports. Um, and this is a discussion about, like we have this web platform, we either have or will have uh, those types of connectivity APIs. Uh, and the question was, is there any remaining gap? Are there use cases that are not addressed by those specs, either existing ones or proposed ones? And in that discussion, we had uh, pretty good feedback from uh, the web community, namely the problem with building uh, DHTs, uh, got highlighted by Ferros. And then uh, we, as a browsers and community, uh, special interest group from IPFS and LIP2P projects uh, prepared like a short summary of where we are right now, what are our primary use cases, and how we try to address those use cases, but which, uh, like each transport, each API has its own limitations. So it was like a very high level uh, feedback about gaps that exist right now on the web platform, uh, just to like, put them uh, out there uh, so people are aware what are those gaps. And the discussion continues. So if you are interested in things like that, uh, the link is in the notes, or you can retweet. Your screen share might be malfunctioning. I understood everything you said. I just didn't get to see anything. <laughs> Really? I I did it all for nothing. <laughs> oh no, you said words and we listened to your words and they meant things. Oh, I, I hate this. I hate this. Okay. I'm also going to point out that now that we're all in the same view, five of the people on this call have kind of the same eyeglasses and you were all lined up in my view just there. <laughs> Can you see my screen now, perhaps? Just the black thing that says started screen sharing. Really? Yeah. Oh, man. That's so, uh, so unfortunate. One second. Uh, maybe, maybe. Zoom has implemented a feature to stop Zoom bombing. Yeah. You joke, but I'm actually considering that. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's maybe go to the peer store update and we circle back when I fix my mess. Sorry for that. Vasco. Yeah, okay. I, I can go. Let me try to share my screen then uh, if it works. Is it working? Yes. Show off. Uh, okay, so you are seeing a peer store improvements issue, right? Correct. Okay, so, <laughs> so yeah, basically um, the milestone one, address book and proto book is now merged. Everything is merged under the JSOP 0.28 release branch. Uh, the second milestone, the deprecate peer info, it's basically decoupled in all these PRs because basically we got rid of the peer info in all the code base and the, the APIs. Uh, and basically, I think we are like at seven out of 18 uh, PRs merged now. All the other ones uh, are ready for review and Jacob has been reviewing them over uh, yesterday and today. Uh, so I think uh, we are in a good shape here to get uh, this milestone uh, all merged by next week. Uh, meanwhile, um, I, will I will start in, oh yeah, another important thing about the, Milestone 2, basically, uh, as we are removing peer info from uh, uh, LibHP, basically peer info was with what we were using to provide to LibHP which addresses uh, should the node listen to. And so as we now don't provide peer info anymore in the libhp.create, basically we are, we, have, uh, we are providing through configuration the list of uh, addresses that the peer wants to listen on. However, uh, since we have been working, uh, thinking about doing another thing for a while, which is uh, more than uh, supporting the listen addresses to support the announce and no announce addresses, uh, last weekend I, I got a little bored about some stuff and basically I decided to create an address management, which will handle all these listen announce and no announce addresses. 
Uh, I also think to, with Jake about it. And yeah, basically, we will also support the announced and unannounced addresses, which will be particularly cool for, for example, if you want to listen on your uh, uh, private address in your in your home, but you want to, as you of course will need to uh, announce the, your public network uh, IP network to the outside world, and so we couldn't do that before, and now we will be able to do this with that. Uh, and yeah, and so basically, I will start this week uh, in the back data store, which will add the persistence to the address book and the proto book. And uh, hopefully by uh, our next call, I aim to have uh, the, the old uh, milestone PR, milestone two PRs merged and uh, uh, the third milestone ready to review. And yeah, that's it. Any questions or comments? It's awesome, man. Uh, I have one as a, a newcomer. Uh, do, those, uh, does that affect any work in the web uh, GUI part? Do I need to update anything on the on the browser, or uh, is it all seamless? I don't think so because uh, I think this will be only internal changes from IPFS land. So I will. I'm also working on integrating uh, uh, this, these new breaking changes from GSLPTP into GSIPFS, and so basically it's how IPFS consumes uh, LPTP data. So I guess it will not uh, change nothing so far. But if it changes, it will be a long time until it gets to uh, the web UI. So uh, we will think later if we need to. All right. Good. I had a, a, a question for the, you know, how, how far does this put us into the peer store work uh, milestone wise? Are we most of the way, is this the core of the JS libpdp stuff and now you need to do the IPFS end of it? Um, uh, basically, uh, our goal is to have the four, the four initial milestones, which is the P0 for this quarter. Uh, and for that, uh, I'm almost at the off the work, maybe a little bit more now, uh, because basically what I need, except for getting everything merged from milestone two, is to introduce the persistence for the milestone tree, which I think it will be not that hard, uh, considering uh, how things are uh, from the address book and proto book that I did before. And uh, then the key book, uh, for milestone four, with uh, also the lipid key chain and persistence for the keys, uh, which will be a little more tricky, but I don't expect that uh, any major uh, problems. And then the goal is to for uh, me and Jacob and just lipid P to do a RC uh, maybe in three four weeks, uh, and it will include all these and uh, uh, some other stuff that Jacob will be working on. So. This would mean that uh, we would be integrating with the GSIPFS over time, uh, but uh, in three weeks, I would expect that we have a PR also ready, three, four weeks okay. to integrate everything to GSIPFS. And then we will need to wait for the next GSIPFS release. I've synced with uh, uh, Alex yesterday, and he is working on uh, the 0 0.44, I don't remember what it will include, but then the, the goal is to integrate all this stuff in the 0 0.45. Okay, so our RC about halfway through the quarter, it sounds like, that's in three weeks, um, and then ship in final version in 0.45 of JSA mm -hmm. Thank you. I remain skeptical if I'm able to fix my screen sharing. So maybe IPFS CSS update. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I can try to share my screen so you can all look at a PR alongside me. Actually, there's probably some stuff I can show you too. Um, so can y'all see that? Yes. Cool. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so um, this sort of started out as fixing like two little isolated things that were hanging out in the um, IPFS CSS repo and is now like kind of turned into a major release. 
Um, so we have improved the icons reference page so that you actually list the name of the icon in question. Um, and I also went through and reconciled all the missing icons where we had like one in the stroke version and one in the glyph version. So now we have all of these icons. Some point in the future, I want to clean them up. They're not super consistent between each other. And I think it could actually um, stand a, 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 some concentrated visual effort. But, um, but we have them all now, which is great. Um, also replaced the basic teal color with a slightly darker teal color for accessibility purposes. That now means that we get a button where you can have white letters on a teal background and that passes WCAG, I think, double A. Um, also um, added support, we had, a, we had a community contributor who came in and added uh, support for SCSS, which is cool. Um, however, it was just static. It wasn't automatically generated from the core variables file um, that lives at the base level of this project. So added that so that um, you now have the choice to have both um, SCSS and just like regular plain old CSS if you um, don't want uh, SCSS support and um, you don't get your color variables. But as I understand correctly, I think Electron like out of the box doesn't play well with SCSS, just out of the box. I think you actually have to add some modules to make that work. So um, so I left both um, just the vanilla, S, um, the vanilla CSS and, and the SCSS in there as well. Um, also goes and updates to the latest version of Montserrat font which isn't a big deal. It does update to the latest version of Inter, which is a fairly substantial change to that font. Um, we've got a lot of things that are just a lot easier, particularly um, if like a, a, a Western character-based language is not your usual language. So things like um, the lowercase l and the uppercase i are a little bit easier to tell apart. Um, also reconciled um, the font so that we've got 300 through 800 weight for both of the core fonts. Um, Lytle, I need to check in with you. You found something that I think is, is um, you left a comment on this about some like extra files and I think something's getting weird. Um, these are set up as subtrees and um, I think what you're actually seeing is like an earlier version of inter UI, which is what inter used to be called. So if you don't mind, I'd like to chat with you about like what you're seeing in your end. Um, and then just a whole bunch of sort of random, random little fixes. Um, so that should be almost done. Um, I know I was waiting on, um, I was waiting on review from Ollie, but since he's on paternity, I also don't want to bug him too hard. So I'm kind of sort of seeking consensus from the rest of all y'all. Um, you know, I, I think if we do this as a major release, um, to your point, uh, Lytle, that, um, That'll, that's a little bit safer for folks. So I am inclined. Um, I think Ollie had a quick glance at it and he mentioned what the deal was with the subtrees, which I was not aware of. Um, but I think I think once we get the subtree reconciling figured out, um, Lytle, if you smoke tested it and you're happy, I think we should just push this out the door and move on to other stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I smoke tested it with Companion. Everything yeah. looks as expected. So I think that's a good sign. Uh, yeah. I would not yeah. uh, spend too much time. It's possible I, I had some like leftovers from the old build. It was late when I tested it. And like when I reported those uh, additional fonts, I just mentioned okay. it because if we don't use them, it's uh, like one megabyte overhead. We probably yeah. Need that. yeah, and I did, I did add some fonts um, that are not explicitly declared in any of the CSS right now um, because I intend to account for them in future um, because right now we don't have full support on both base fonts for 300 weight all the way up to 800 weight. We had some holes. So I went in and I did add those even so, so they're not explicitly in the CSS rules right now, but they will be at some point. What you're seeing, I think was actually. Oh, I think that's exactly that. Actually, I checked the CSS and uh, okay. listed those who are not. If you are like planning to use them, that's fine. We yeah, I, I do think I think there's room for those just for consistency. Um, also, just like if you're if you're counting on top of this, you know, you don't expect to have like a hole for your 500 font <laughs> and that it just like blows out in a weird way. Um, so also, if somebody's like explicitly on their end, like if, if somebody's starting with this kit and then explicitly declaring like a 500 weight, uh, we don't want it to be missing for them. So even though we're not using it, it's still like a, a, a gracious thing to do. I'm just a little concerned that I think the things that you listed in there were actually um, 
um, stuff like, cause one of them was inter UI, which is the old name, which shouldn't even be in there at all. So I think there's something weird going on with the subtree. So if you don't mind doing like a clean and a rebuild on it and seeing if those are there, it might, it might just be stuff that's left over on your local, but I want to make sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, cool. I'll double check. Yeah. Thank you very much guys. All right. So, so maybe yes, it's my my demo partner. Yeah. <laughs> so I can share you uh, share screen. I can share you the progress I'm making right now. This isn't finished. I need to tweak some things first, but uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, I took into consideration the review uh, that Marcin gave me, and um, I reduced the number of dots, and I aggregated them by distance of, I believe, is ten of these small dots. So if you're in an area close to ten dots, it uh, aggregates into a single group. So, for example, if we hover here in Spain and Portugal, you can see that. There's a lot of connections coming from Spain, Portugal, and France. So it actually just tells, um, oh, I need to fix this though, when I want to over over here. So uh, it tells us that there are five visible connections and 13 plus. Uh, and then it highlights in the table as well. Uh, let's see if I can see any more French connections here. Oh. There he is. So it depends on the part of the map it is. I can adjust these par parameters uh, easily. Uh, I think it depends a bit on the area. Maybe I can add some criteria like uh, for coordinates, for specific coordinates like America. We can probably just aggregate east and west of America. I don't know uh, how's, how's the, the best approach. I need to discuss that with you guys. But it's kind of the work in progress. I need to make it bigger and like maybe tell a name that tells, uh, a no that puts a number that tells how many connections they are there, how many peers. Uh, but most of it, it just works up to five as it was. And then after five, it adds uh, more label. Like for example, here in South Asia, there's 148 plus peers connected. And after that, I just need to test it again with 5k peers to make sure it's not lagging. Uh, I tested it before and it was good, but I haven't tested with um, overing all this table while also overing the map so it can get uh, a bit laggy. So yeah, I guess that's the update for from the peers uh, map. This is super cool. I think it's going to be really, really useful and just interesting from an exploration standpoint. As far as yep. dividing up America, you, you aren't going to want to hear this, but I'd say each state gets to be its own. <laughs> and there's 50 of them, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I just said a, po a quick possibility of my, out of my head just yep. to provide you like a list of possibilities. Uh, we can add them. But if you just want to make like 10 dots around, just aggregate 10 dots around it, it's easier for all the world instead of just specifying for each part of the world. But if it provides useful information for the user, I guess we can do it by state and by country and everything else. Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing other thoughts on that too. But we can, we can take that into the issue. This is really great. Thank you. Yeah super 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 helpful visual to understand because previously we had just like a, a lot of dots which were one on top of another uh which gave a pretty good picture that how that like how dense uh stuff is in europe or each side of us or in asia the problem was you and still it, it kind of is it's hard to quickly eyeball the like the order of magnitude like that you have 10 dots here and you have a hundred dots there when you put them one on top of another they look the same you lose the, after like 10 you basically it looks the same and i feel we need to figure it out the way either by the size or the or or some other way just like you said maybe an 
if it's more than a hundred, maybe we put a number because like the dot itself is big enough so you can put a number. Uh, so that's uh, totally something we'll figure it out going forward. Yeah. It's super I'm, exciting. I'm going to link, I hate to do this, but I'm going to link to the New York Times coronavirus map because they're doing good things with sizes of circles and numbers inside of them. And I think a lot of us have been staring at that map way too much lately, but it is also kind of rapidly establishing a visual precedent for a, a lot of people right now. I'll throw that into the issue. Cool. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Rafael. Um, how about IPFS mobile design research? Dietrich, I think it's yours. Hey, yeah, I just wanted to link to this. This is a presentation. We had an IPFS dev grant for doing a couple of months of research into existing patterns and, and builders of P2P apps on mobile, both native and then also sharing flows and things like that on browsers. Uh, and then next phase, condensing that into a very small set of high impact recommendations for people who are building PM, P2P on mobile, specifically with uh, uh, IPFS in mind. Um, the first phase of that was presented last week at the local and offline collaborations uh, monthly meetup. Uh, and the, the researcher is going to start on the next phase, uh, hopefully the next week or so. Um, and with a publication eventually in the Git book, all the research findings are linked there and are, are in the Git book. Uh, read, reading, it, it relates to us in browsers and to the extent that we haven't really, like our first release was IPFS uh, support in Opera on Android, was our first mobile support. Um, but I think as, as we move forward, we need to be able to have a clearer picture of uh, how IPFS addresses move between applications on mobile what the end user flow is for how that is possible. How, how do people get CIDs? How, how do people, where do people put CIDs? Uh, and then also for IPFS data access on mobile, um, we, we haven't really, we don't, we don't have an official like local node yet. Uh, there are some projects around there, uh, but I think the findings from this research can also inform what our next steps are around unifying what a, what a IPFS node on mobile might be uh, understanding of what differently either like light client approaches versus full node approaches and finding where the sweet spot is there where we can give as much decentralizing user centered user data ownership um, capability on mobile but without burning down the CPU and battery and eating up uh, everyone's bandwidth. So hopefully some of this research will help us narrow down from a protocol implementation standpoint uh, some of the requirements and then for the next 10,000 uh, apps built on mobile that use P2P or IPFS, make them not suck and, and hopefully be awesome. Fingers crossed. Uh, notes and video of like presentation of mobile design research, like the first part uh, will be in the meeting notes. Um, I can try once again to share my screen, but I won't bother you if it does not work. Uh, so just a quick not check. Not yet. Can you see anything no, at all? It's a black screen. <laughs> well, if I want to share a black night someday, that would be useful, but uh, all right. So I will talk about my remaining items. Apologies that I don't have proper setup to share. Um, so, I believe I mentioned about Native Protocol Handler API link to the uh, grant, grant is in the notes. The thread discussion thread about filling the remaining gap between WebSockets, WebRTC, and Web Transport is there as well. If you want to retweet Dietrich's tweet, it's also there. Uh, and I have a question which I hope to back up by a demo. And now I will explain to you how I would demo it. And you need to use the power of your imagination to think how it would look like if Lidl showed up to me to make his case. So um, we have a browser extension called IPFS Companion and we have IPFS Desktop, uh, which is a GUI application for managing local uh, IPFS node. So now, we are in the process of releasing Go IPFS 0.5. Uh, that's the actual daemon which 
is orchestrated by IPFS desktop, right? So with Go IPFS 0.5, we will support subdomain gateways, which I talked so many times, no one wants to hear about it anymore. However, while I was implementing that, I also implemented HTTP proxy mode. So HTTP proxy is a service which you can use for as an like intermediate uh, node when you request HTTP request. And with Go IPFS 0.5, you will be able to use the gateway port as HTTP proxy for subdomain gateway host names defined in the configuration, but also for every DNS link host name that you would like to fetch through that proxy. And here's the problem. Uh, the HTTP proxy does not support encryption. Like encryption, the TLS needs something that you need to put on top of the proxy. You need to put NGINX in front of it, set up certificates, and you are not able to get a certificate for a domain name that you don't own. So that effectively means, even though you can load, let's say, uh, IPFS.io or libp2p.io website, which is backed by DNS link, you can uh, fetch that from HTTP proxy, that will be on the HTTP colon slash slash protocol. You won't be able to load that website from Go IPFS if you use HTTPS, because you won't be able to produce a certificate for that domain name. Um, so that's why that's the main blocker why we don't have, like don't keep the original domain name in the address bar and need to have that, that IPFS, that localhost port uh, suffix. However, the, the ENS, uh, Ethereum naming service system, uh, they, have this custom top level domain name called that ETH. And it's impossible to get certificate for that uh, host name if you use that TLD. That means there's no problem of uh, HSTS headers uh, being present and breaking, um, and breaking uh, the connection. Because if the browser sees the HSTS header, it will force uh, TLS encryption. And if we use HTTP proxy, that proxy won't be able to support HTTPS. Uh, I feel uh, that's pretty long description. So I'll just summarize it once again. Uh, we may be able to uh, keep uh, ETH addresses in location bar with companion. The question is, should we do that by default or out of the box when someone has IPFS desktop and uh, IPFS companion installed? Or should we, maybe that's, uh, that's actually an answer, but I just wanted to uh, hear what you feel about this. Should we like support that out of the box when someone enters like IPFS.eth? Should that just work? Or should we, redirect that to the local host thing and make it as an experiment to keep that in the location bar. Uh, it's really difficult to explain this without screen sharing. So I apologize. Um, was it even remotely useful to imagine it? Or should I push the question to the next week? Yeah. I, I think we should definitely bring it up again. I think we're, we're only starting to walk down the road of asking these types of questions, what the long-term ramifications are. From a, from a user experience standpoint, I have real concerns about um, creating URLs that are not, that the U is not there, that they are, they break, um, you know, that, that, that fundamentally defeats the purpose of and, and goal of the IPFS project. Uh, However, I understand the value that short-term usability improvements like readable URLs uh, or re readable RLs or readable addresses ha may have in the acceleration and adoption of the project. Uh, also as a experiment in 
different ways to be able to marry naming systems with the addressability. So uh, I, I, would, I would encourage us to keep poking at this from an experimental standpoint. I, I don't think that I, I'm worried also about machinery that we build up around user experience that we eventually must tear down uh, if this does not materially contribute to a, a permanent part of our stepping stones that, uh, that we're laying down on the roads to a universally addressable uh, IPFS and distributed web, then we should be very cautious about encouraging developers and designers and businesses to, to build on to this Rube Goldberg machine if we're going to pull it out from under them eventually. So I, I, um, there's some trade-offs probably, uh, but we can use language like experiment and things like that to be able to say, uh, and, and, and writing about it and pointing about it. Like, hey, we, a blog post that says, hey, we introduced this feature, here are the constraints, here are the benefits, we don't know what it really looks like yet, many people are experimenting in this area. So uh, delivering something like this in a way that makes it very clear that this is not the end all be all, uh, but we something to learn from and play with, talk about the pros and cons, I would really encourage that. Okay, it sounds like uh, starting with opt-in experiment, we have like an experiment, uh, experiment section in companions preferences added there as an opt-in. Uh, I'll probably it will make a demo hopefully next week. Uh, so that will be clear because uh, it's super easy when you see it. It's super hard to explain it or maybe I'm just not the best person to explain it. Um, yeah, and I also totally agree with the fact that uh, the local gateway URLs are not universal. However, they are still better than a URL which looks like a thing that should work and does not work. Because right now when you enter ipfs.eth, it will break. However, if you have a companion, it will like, it will fix that load and load it from a local gateway. The address bar will change. It will be ipfs.eth.ipns localhost. But at least user knows, hey, it's from the local host. Uh, maybe that's why it does not work. If we don't add the suffix, it won't, simply won't work without any good explanation, right? So. Uh, let's think uh, about this as an experiment, at least for now, yeah. All right, folks, I don't believe we have any more agenda items. Uh, I had a question about WebSocket Stardust. What is the next step? Uh, Vashkur, do you have any like, uh, thoughts? Yeah. What uh, would be the next step? So the goal initially was to replace the infra that we have the, for WebSocket Star with the, the Stardust server. But uh, uh, basically then when You're cutting out, Josh. The suspense, the suspense is killing me. Aren't you, can, can you listen to me now? Oh, you are back. Yeah, okay. yes. can you just okay. repeat last uh, 30 seconds? <laughs> and it's gone. That's, it's good again. Sorry, uh, I know what's happening with my internet now. Maybe, maybe, maybe try disabling video. Yeah, okay. It looks like it's, uh, it's, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so going back to the beginning again, uh, initial plan was to replace the WebSocket star infra that we have uh, with the Stardust server. Uh, but then when we discussed, me and Jacob and Machi, the, um, the, peer, the PubSub peer discovery with the Relay server, we thought that it would be a better use for the infra that we have because our goal, uh, our end goal is to have the Relay server and uh, so uh, the we the stardust is usable and uh, uh, any users want can that want to use it can use it but from an uh, infra perspective we are bearing on uh, uh, basically deploying the relay server instead and use the, and recommend people to use the pubsub one because 
uh, it's more performant. We while in the Stardust, we don't. Uh, we are actually doing a double encryption because of uh, needing to use SecIO and then WSS. Uh, while if we do the pub sub version, it's way simpler, both in uh, implementation and in performance as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the Stardust, I would say the Stardust, it's uh, what we sh people should use now, while we don't have the relays and the relay deployed, but I think it's a question of like weeks because Jacob already finished all the implementation of the, the PubSub peer discovery and is currently finishing the, the relay so that we can ask the infra team to deploy it. Uh, could you hear me well? Was it clear? Yeah, yeah it was fine. Cool, uh, thank you. So. Uh, my so f effectively for now if someone wants to use uh, js ipfs in a web browser they either need to use the older version with websocket star or they need to set up their own websocket stardust they right can, they can the only websocket stardust instance that there is is the one provided by mache i think right uh yes i think so as well they can use uh, the webrtc uh, star one uh, which uh, uh, we don't have as well deployed but that it's in a more uh, uh, advanced stage because we Jacob already opened the issue for the infra team but we are still waiting on them to deploy the newest version with the uh, sync await stuff uh, so for now people also need to use their own uh, server to to use it and uh, hopefully in the near future the the relay Okay, um, and, and the idea for relays is to make every, like the default bootstrappers relays as well, or are we thinking in some like additional uh, setting somewhere, like for preload nodes? Uh, I think I'm, we are going to a different setup because we, I don't know what is the current status of the spec for relays, but we wanted to uh, really make uh, relays an important piece of infrastructure. Yeah, I think I think uh, it cut cut off Vasco once again, and now without video, we don't even know. <laughs> um, okay, so. Yeah, I, th I think uh, that's a bit unfortunate situation. Uh, we are in, in, in it sounds like we are in, there are multiple transitions happening. Like one is uh, entire JavaScript ecosystem moving from the old uh, API to the async iterators. Uh, due to that, we don't have WebSocket star available for use. And we have like public server, the default public server for that. Um, WebSocket star is available, but the only public server is the one provided by Mache. It's not even like official one. And relays are not here yet. Um, so, so that's, that's a bit, bit unfortunate done. situation. I wonder can if you, we can do Can you listen to me? To... Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm saying that- for, uh... for a while. Uh, that the WebRTC star server is also on the way to getting deployed. We already have the, the issue in infra and that would be the short term uh, thing to have deployed so that people could use as a public server. Uh, and uh, after that, it will be the, um, the relay server. I don't I don't know expectations for the timeline to have the web the WebRTC uh, deployed, but uh, we already have the the all the Docker setup for automatic uh, deploys, and we already uh, opened the the issue for infra. So we basically are now waiting on uh, the infra team to switch the the current old WebRTC star with the new one. Okay. Um. Yeah, so 
So, so that, that, that there's a plan. Uh, what about those Docker images we had? Uh, is it are those like ready for use if I want to run my own WebSocket WebRTC one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are uh, they are uh, already usable, and that's that's what we delivered today for him. Okay, okay. I I think it makes sense. It it acts sort of like a forcing function for people to self-host, uh, mm -hmm. but that may be. Uh, like net positive in the long run. Uh, we've seen this problem with uh, various projects on the on the GitHub uh, when I was like looking for people who are building stuff. Like, nearly everyone was using the default servers, like the default WebSocket star ones, uh, and this may be probably better, like healthier situation where people learn to self-host from the get-go. Um, yeah, the goal the goal is to people to deploy their own because the public is I would say the public is mostly for demos and uh, to for people to experiment. But when people start to really creating their own project, they should uh, also run their own uh, server because one of the things that we say from the beginning in all the uh, tutorials and examples for these repos is that we don't. Uh, uh, guarantee the, the availability of the servers. Okay, makes sense. Uh, so those Docker images are under lip 2 p uh, org at the Docker Hub, In right? the Docker Hub, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, oh, I think we have links on the, uh, on, in, on the readmes of respective projects. Uh, I just wanted to uh, mention it if someone is listening. Um, all right, thank you for the update. Any questions related to the uh, transport situation in a web browser for JSIPFS, namely? I'm, I'm and liking that more and more people are piling into that thread, sharing perspectives. It'll be very interesting to see, uh, ultimately the long-term impact of these types of threads is very difficult to understand and, and may have nothing specific material. Um, but I, I think it definitely helps us to be very clear about one, what our use cases are and two, what our web platform gaps are. So I think it was great that we spent invested the time in articulating that well. Thanks everybody who jumped in and helped and gave feedback on that post. Cool. Um, let me quickly check if there is, is there anything I missed? I'm a mess this week. This screen sharing thing totally distracted me. Um, I think we covered all, all the topics we had on the agenda. Um, expect more interesting work in the web UI land in the following weeks. Um, I try to figure it out how to demo uh, uh, ETH experiment next week. Uh, in two weeks, it's a bi-weekly call. In some, if someone did not notice it, it's bi-weekly call. So I have more time to fix my screen sharing. Um, hey, but, all right, hey, but, but uh, and uh, this weekly next week is lightning talks. So there's early, earlier time to demo then. Somebody might ask you at the last minute to demo something. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. Okay. I cannot win. You could this. restart your machine, uh, but you'd have to nuke your like 12,000 browser tabs. All the, all the, I'm, all the I'm tabs come back. I'm fetching entire like Kiwi's archive behind the scenes. So I think I stopped it. I was worried it will make everyone choppy and I'm the person who's recording. All right, folks, uh, any, any ad hoc topics? Cool. Uh, let's meet next time in two weeks with better screen sharing on my end. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.